Hi everyone and welcome to Chem Talk, where today we will be discussing nomenclature for basic ionic and covalent compounds. So, let's talk about it. Nomenclature is the term for the rules we follow in naming things. In the science world, it is most common to follow IUPAC guidelines. This is so any chemist from any country can know exactly the compound we're talking about when we are discussing different chemicals. Let's start with monoatomic ion compounds. If you need some review on what a monoatomic ion is, make sure and go watch our ionic and molecular compounds video. Compounds that only contain monoatomic ions are named by the following rule. It's the name of the cation plus the name of the anion with "-ide", replacing the suffix. NaCl is sodium and chlorine, but you replace the ene with "-ide", to make it sodium chloride. Na2O is the same. It is sodium and oxygen, but you replace the ending with "-ide", to make it sodium oxide. Al4C3 has aluminum and carbon, which then becomes aluminum carbide. Compounds with polyatomic ions are named similarly to monoatomic compounds, but with no ide ending. You name it by first stating the name of the cation, and then the name of the polyatomic ion. NaHCO3 would then become sodium bicarbonate, and Na2SO3 would become sodium sulfide. These ones are pretty simple because you just name the cation first and then you just say the name of the polyatomic ion. For compounds with a transition metal that has different charges, they are named by different rules. You start with the name of the cation and then in parentheses you put the Roman numerals of its charge, then the name of the anion with the IDE ending, like before. Cu2O3 then becomes copper 3 oxide, and HgCl will become mercury 1 chloride. Now you might be wondering how we determine the charges. Take copper 2 oxide. We know that we have 2 coppers and 3 oxygens, but we also know that oxygen has a 2 minus charge. If you remember from our last video where we went over ionic compounds, you can cross the charges to the other side to know how many of each you will need in the molecule when combining ions. So by doing the reverse, you can determine the charges on both the copper and the oxygen. And we can double check this by knowing that oxygen always has a two minus charge. The nice thing about naming ionic compounds is that the charges tell us how many of each atom are in the compound. This is why covalent compounds have a different set of rules. For inorganic, aka non-carbon containing covalent compounds, they are named like ionic compounds but with prefixes to determine how many of each atom are in the compound. You first do the prefix, then the name of the cation, and then another prefix for the name of the anion but with an ending of IDE. This list is a short list of prefixes that we will be using today, but you can find a compiled list on the ChemTalk website. But for today's uses, 1 is mono, 2 is di, 3 will be tri, 4 is tetra, and 5 will be penta. So let's look at CO. We have carbon, and we have 1 oxygen. So we can write down carbon, mono, oxygen. Now we know that the oxygen will become oxide, which leaves us with carbon monoxide. Now you might be wondering why carbon doesn't have a prefix. This is because we don't give a prefix for leading monocations. If we had two carbons, we would put dicarbon monoxide. But since we only have one, we leave it off, and it's assumed that we only have one in the compound. Now look at N2O5. We have two nitrogens and five oxygens. So we can write down dinitrogen, penta, oxygen. Now oxygen will become oxide, so we're left with dinitrogen pentoxide. 
compounds that have a hydrogen and release an H plus ion in water are named to highlight that chemical property, which makes it an acid. Binary acids only have one nonmetal and a hydrogen and are named with hydro as the prefix and then the name of the nonmetal with an ic suffix and the word acid. I want you guys to note that this is only in aqueous conditions where the hydronium ion is going to be released. If this was a gas or a metal, it would stay the same way as we've been naming previously. So let's look at HCl. We have hydro, chlorine, which goes to chloric, and then we add the word acid to make hydrochloric acid. For HBr, we start with hydro, bromine, which goes to bromic, so we have hydrobromic acid. Just a reminder that this is only in the aqueous form. Oxyacids are when acids contain a hydrogen, an oxygen, and a nonmetal. These are named using the anion first. For any compound with the suffix "-ate", it's turned into "-ic", and with "-ite", it's turned into "-us", and then you add the word acid. As you know, ClO4 is perchlorate, so for HClO4, Perchlorate becomes perchloric to make perchloric acid. For H2SO4, sulfate becomes sulfic to make sulfuric acid. Now let's practice naming some compounds together. Pause and try them and then we'll go over the answers. Name the following compounds. NAI, K2SO4, HDI, SO2, HF aqueous, and H3PO4 aqueous. Now starting off with the first one, we have sodium and we have iodine. Now we know that iron has to become ide and we're left with sodium iodide. For the second one, we know that sulfate is a polyatomic ion. So we just name the metal first, potassium, and then the polyatomic ion, which is sulfate, which just gives us potassium sulfate. HGI is a little bit more tricky. So we know that mercury can have multiple charges, so first we have to determine which charge the mercury has. So, since there are no subscripts for either mercury or iodine, we're going to go ahead and cross up the charges, and as we know, iodine has a negative 1 charge. So, we know in order to make a neutral compound, mercury would have to have a plus 1 charge. That being said, we can write mercury, parentheses, 1, iodine, but we know that ine has to turn into ide to leave us with mercury 1 iodide. For SO2, we have a covalent compound, so we need to have prefixes. First, we have sulfur, and then we know we have two oxygens, so we have to put dioxygen. Oxygen will then become oxide to make sulfur dioxide. For HF, it's important to note that it's an aqueous form, which means it's going to release that H plus ion and make it an acid. So we start with hydro, and then we know we have fluorine. The INE ending will then become ic to make us hydrofluoric acid. For H3PO4, it's aqueous, so we also know it's going to be an acid. So we start with the anion, which is phosphate. 8 will become ic, so then we're left with phosphoric acid. Now, let's summarize what we've learned today. We use IUPAC guidelines to name compounds. Memorizing rules is essential to naming ionic and inorganic molecular compounds, like we learned today. Covalent compounds need prefixes to determine the number of atoms in a compound. Hydrogen-containing compounds are named normally, except when aqueous, when they will follow acid rules. 
Now that's all for today on Nomenclature for Basic Compounds. Thank you for tuning in to Chem Talk. Make sure and visit our website, www.chemistrytalk.org, for hundreds of more chemistry, biochemistry, and organic chemistry videos.